The more I learn about those guys, the more I don't like them. Happy New Year from Mind Matters, everyone. It is 2022, and we have we've got a whole year planned out of shows, right? We've got our whole schedule mapped out for the next three years. Yes, yeah, the next three. We've got a five-year plan, actually. <laughs> five-year plan. Production will be up. We'll beat all of our quotas, and uh, we'll have the. It'll be huge. The, yeah, the most productive Mind Matters factory on the planet. Um, seriously, we don't have a five-year plan, but we do have some, some ideas for where we're going to go this year. Um, of course we will be continuing many of the themes that we've covered last year and even the year before, uh, we'll be talking more about ponderology. That's for sure. Uh, we'll probably have some, uh, some nice news about that in the coming weeks or, uh, I don't know, month. We'll see. But on another note, maybe we, we didn't cover... Like last year, we we went on and on a lot about totalitarianism and and uh, ponderology and things like that, with a you know a few a few little veerings off from that course. But um, I think this year we're going to be talking about this book on more than one episode. This is Ian McGilchrist's new book, "The Matter with Things." This is just. Volume one, and it weighs about 30 pounds. Um, it's two volumes equal size. Um, it was too big to print in one book. This is the book he's been working on for like the last 10, 12 years, something like that. And I was looking forward to this when he mentioned it in his discussion with Jordan Peterson a couple of years ago. They had a talk for, I think it was just 45 minutes, but uh, McGilchrist discussed some of the things that he that he was going to talk about in this book. And it just came out a couple months ago, I believe. So we'll be returning to this one. Maybe today we'll just give a little bit of a, an overview of what's in there so far. I'm only, I'm only about 190 pages in, and that's about 10% of the book, so, or maybe a bit more than that. So we'll be talking about that. And then in the next couple of weeks, we'll probably do a show on this book, Wall Street and the Russian Revolution. I got this as a birthday present or a Christmas present. And well, I was looking about, I'd heard Anthony Sutton had written a book, Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution in the mm -hmm. 70s. And that's kind of like, it's considered a, a classic and kind of a classic of con conspiracy theory, but, but Sutton's a serious researcher was. And um, that book was some of the connections he'd found between Wall Street and the Bolsheviks. And this one is written by Richard B. Spence. This is a more recent book. It just came out in uh, maybe 2016, 2017. So it's only four years old. And it's kind of like a an expansion. He uh, Spence had originally planned on editing a new version of Sutton's book, but I guess had so much material. I don't know if there was a problem with getting the rights, but he had so much new material that he decided to just write his own book and expand it because he, there were, well, a lot has come to light in the last 50 years that wasn't available uh, to Sutton or that Sutton couldn't find at the time. So this one, um, the reason it's called it and the Russian revolution is because it spans the years 1905 to 1925. So from the, the first Russian revolution, the failed revolution, 1905 to 25 after, uh, you know, near the end of the civil war there. And it's very interesting. It kind of reminds me of um, the hidden history of World War I, I believe it's called. I um, can't remember the author's names, but just a look at all the, all the stuff that was going on that you don't, you know, you never hear about in high school when you're learning about these subjects, unless you've got a really cool teacher. But this one is about the, well, there's this whole network, this whole web of revolutionaries and like spies and cells in all these countries. And then wall street bankers and Russian emigres that moved that and were living in the United States and, and all these geopolitical angles that were all going on in the early 1900s and just creating this kind of nexus of intrigue and money laundering and, you know, paying for 
for revolution revolutionists like uh, like Lenin and Trotsky and and guys that you've never heard of, mm -hmm. just to to essentially foment and carry out this revolution. And then you've got the the rich millionaire socialists living in the United States who think this is a good idea, and each kind of have their maybe have some of their own agendas, but the, all their agendas kind of aligned and in certain ways to the point where I don't know what his final conclusion is going to be, um, just kind of to, to wrap it all together, but you wouldn't, uh, on the surface of it, on the surface of it, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily make that leap that, uh, that wall street supported the, you know, wall street bankers, you know, big wall street bankers supported the, a communist revolution. The very but, antithesis yeah. of, uh, but it kind of makes sense, Communist especially thinking. when when you consider um, some of the stuff that Michael Rechtenwald has written um, in recent years about the the nature of well, today it's kind of like a woke woke capitalism. Mm -hmm. But he he talks about um, the Gillette, you know, the guy Gillette who created Gillette razors, and how he was like a a super like socialist. He wanted to create this socialist utopia, and he thought the way to do that was through um, monopoly. Like you create one giant corporation to, to rule them all and that pr provides everything and, and essentially a dictatorship of the, of the corporation, of the monopoly. And so that's what a lot of guys, these guys were like, these rich millionaires. They had these idealistic kind of utopian visions, some of them. And then some of them were just, uh, you know, kind of rapacious. They just wanted to get in there um, and take over the country, you know, monetarily. So that's why I say you have all these different... Uh, kind of somewhat conflicting, but overlapping motivations and uh, agendas. And that's how you get uh, all the all the intrigue and things that you find in that book. But we'll get into that another time, unless you wanted to. Well, just a, a quick comment about that. I haven't read the book yet, but um, it does, on the surface of it at least, remind me a little bit of the power that... Uh, corporations like BlackRock and Vanguard have that um, are in charge of trillions of dollars. I, I might be exaggerating that a little bit, but it's incredible sums of money, larger than the GDPs of a lot of Western nations who have their, uh, their influence and tentacles, not only in high finance, but only, but also in politics. Uh, you know, they have, uh, inroads into uh, the Treasury Department and the Fed and and governmental organizations. They um, they are behind this uh, great new reset that we're seeing coming about. So it is interesting to look back and to see how the 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 great moneyed interests. Uh, the the investors, the people who were in a position to wield an incredible amount of influence by uh, sheer fact of, of how much they owned and how much they were able to put money into various political movements, how that kind of reverberates into this uh, current time we're in and how these uber mega corporations uh, are basically doing a very similar thing. Um, and, uh, and the mechanisms by which they exercise their influence and control have always been around, uh, except that we're now seeing it on this kind of, you know, on steroids level of, um, uh, of influence. So I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I think it's, it's probably going to inform a lot of our, uh, thinking and, and the way we look at what we see occurring today. It would be, yeah, it'll be interesting to, to get into that one and, and see what he has to say about how Wall Street was doing the influencing and all that. Because as you say, you know, we have these, you know, giant mega trusts essentially or whatever they are that, you know, who don't necessarily have like 51% control of, of each and every corporation, but they have just enough of a controlling interest to be able to have a vastly disproportionate amount of influence over the way society and the economy functions and, and flows. And so it makes me wonder if something like that is maybe like a learning 
process. Like you don't want to have your name and your brand be up in everyone's faces because if something goes wrong, then, then they know who to blame. Right. But if you have just this tiny, just enough and all of these other little places, well, then you're basically like shielded behind, you know, layers upon layers of obfuscation, Mm -hmm. which is kind of perfect. If you know what you're trying to do is control things behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. Uh, (laughs) That reminds me of a a recent video that JP Sears did. It was, it was a long one. Uh, It was almost 20 minutes, I think. And it was his like 10 bits of advice or something for, for aspiring authoritarians. (laughs) And I, I won't go into specific details of what he was talking about, but he, he did recommend that um, when you do something, when you do something silly, like or make a, you make a bad decision in public, like a, a certain big industry, and um, and you're losing your credibility. It's like the thing that you should have done in the first place was create front companies. You mm-hmm. know, you you lay the blame on someone else. You don't uh, you don't make it easy for um, for the blame to be brought back on your doorstep. And that's what these guys were doing. And then that's just, that's kind of rule number one for uh, um, political intrigue. And yeah. so these guys would, uh, you know, like uh, Spence comments a few times in the book so far, it's not like you're going to find um, a canceled check from the banker Jacob Schiff written to Leon Trotsky. Um, that's not the way things worked. And that's not the way Schiff worked. And so there were, you know, money would be handed out in cash and it would be going to these organizations. And then you, you can't really trace this money. And that's a lot of the stuff that was going on. Like, uh, you know, Trotsky goes to gets put in prison in Spain and then <clears throat> doesn't have any money. And then some mysterious benefactor gets him out of prison. And all of a sudden he's got um, like first class tickets to, to the U S and then he, gets to the U S and all of a sudden, you know, meets a bunch of these, you know, big names and gets a, gets an apartment, gets an apartment and like an allowance. And no one knows where he's getting this money. Of course there was speculation about who was paying him, but, uh, and he doesn't say in his, like in his memoirs, he basically says he was dirt poor and didn't have anything, but he's getting this money to stay at like the, stay at the Astro hotel and, um, where all the, you know, big bankers hang out and, um, things like that. So, that's kind of the that's kind of what was going on, but this it kind of, it also relates back to the show we did a uh, previous show on the managerial class where we talk, we were talking about some of the work of Michael McConkey and um, the way that the the way that manier, the manager, managerial class operates and has operated for the last hundred years plus, and that is to uh, part of it is that um, what was it called uh, negative negative opposition or. Uh, whatever the name for it was, kind of like controlled opposition, where you can have, you know, the the movers and shakers that will be funding and even creating to a large degree the very opposition that's that they seem to be battling. Um, so in this case, socialist revolutionaries, um, that kind of thing going on. And so like I mentioned, there were competing interests in the in the Russian Revolution, at least the, on the talking about the American influence or the influence within America, not necessarily by Americans and um, how you had some kind of idealists that were, um, you know, some kind of socialist ideal idealists. And then you had um, people who had more of a political agenda, like Schiff himself was kind of pro-German and this was during world war one around the time of world war one. So you had this kind of geopolitical conflict going on. He was kind of on the German side. And then you had pure kind of purely anti-Russian, anti-Tsarist sentiment going on at the time too. So you had, you had a lot of, um, American, um, American Jews who had come from Russia who, um, were naturally, um, you know, strongly anti-Tsarist. So they were, they wanted essentially regime change in Russia. They wanted to get rid of the czar. And so they, they, they had all kinds of anti-czarist organizations that were, um, kind of like, kind of like lobby groups, um, today that were agitating for revolution in, in Russia for, um, like denying Russia any loans in the years 
um, years leading up to World War One and first years of World War One, I, I believe, I believe it's also the first years of World War One, and and oh, Mark Twain, Mark Twain was part of these organizations too. He kind of like totally bought into all of the all the stuff that these guys were saying. And a lot of it was just propaganda, kind of like what's going on today. Like some of it was, of course, true, but the but things would be blown way out of proportion or just manufactured, and to make. To, to make uh, like the czar Nicholas out to be kind of like a, a thousand times worse than he actual actually was. Mm -hmm. And, and there were, there were intrigues between him uh, or, or between these Americans and like Russian politicians who were part of the like Imperial court and like, and the, the liberal politicians who got into, into, into power to some degree after 1905. So, well, all that stuff was kind of going on, but Another time. We'll get to that <laughs> another time. But, uh, well, that kind of leads me, I still want to talk a little bit about the matter of things, but maybe first we could, uh, we had a comment on one of our old videos. Um, do you guys want me to read it or do you want to read it? Well, I've got it here. Okay. So yeah, we wanted to respond to this comment. Um, might help uh, clarify our views on some things. And uh, yeah seems seems fitting go ahead all right so uh publius ovidius wrote strange and this was on the the video on the dark triad of the far left and far right i can't from, remember for sure yeah it might have been that was uh i'm pretty sure that was what the, the episode was called but he wrote he wrote uh strange that you guys don't mention the fact that MAGA and trumpism are based on white victimhood. You want to pin victimhood on the left while ignoring it on the right. Also strange that you don't discuss the white identitarians much at all, focusing instead on the far left and your strange fantasies of college SJWs turning into Mao. You also significantly omit the rise of right-wing fascism using exaggerated fears of the left to take power and destroy democracy. That's how Hitler did it. That's what's going on in Hungary and Poland. Uh, and that's what's going on in the U.S. And Mind Matters is contributing to that process. FBI has stated for decades that far-right extremism, not from the left, not from Muslims, is the main source of domestic ter terrorism in the U.S. today. Well, I, I mean, there's so much to say about <laughs> all of that. But let's start with the very last point about the FBI. Um, and, you know, in that statement about white supremacism and terrorism in the U.S. because uh, the fact of the matter is that they had to, to close that department that was specialized on or in uh, white extremist terrorism precisely because there wasn't any. Um, you know, that, that's, that's something that came out. This is one of those departments that they, that they create in order to bolster the perception that there is a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think the, the commenter might benefit from the fact that the FBI is adept at creating political enemies of the state. They've been doing it since, um, well, since their inception, pretty much. Uh, but in contemporary history, one of the biggest examples of this was with Muslim terrorists in the U.S., uh, with the probably more than a dozen cases that I'm aware of where, um, you know, you, you have halfwits or, or people who have been uh, induced to participate in a, in a plan to commit some form of terrorism in the U.S., which was actually conceived of, supported by, organized by informants and, and members of the FBI themselves. And all of these cases, when they came to light, fell apart. Um, so uh, this is, um, I mean, that, that, that speaks to uh, the idea that, um, you know, we have this white supremacist, you know, terrorist problem in the U.S., even if it's, even if it's been put that way or discussed that way or, or uh, propagated as a, an idea in the media, it just doesn't exist. Uh, in the way that uh, it's been made out to to be. It's a creation. It's a fabrication. Yeah, with a, a case in point for 
for that was the you know the recent uh planning to kidnap the the like Gretchen michigan Whitmer. governor or you know some governor somewhere yeah you know it was supposed to be this right-wing terror plot and then come to find out that half of the people that were involved with it or more were all uh fbi agents or undercover agents or something like that like this is exactly what you're talking about where yeah. the fbi grabs a bunch of halfwits says hey we should go do this thing and then as soon as they say yeah we should you know that sounds like not a bad idea they're like see see we got them they're, they're pl they were planning on it they were planning on doing this and and we've caught them doing it never mind that all they did was say like oh that's not a bad idea and yeah. It, it so yeah it's just totally contrived uh uh, Plato, it's Plato's cave. They create the shadows, you know, the hand puppets that cast the shadows on the wall that everyone can, can point to and say, see, look, there's a dragon. Meanwhile, it's just like, you know, somebody's hand in a candle, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, I gotta, like, there are some things about this comment I like and a couple things I'll go through it. And, um, some things I kind of actually agree with, but, um, that last focusing on that last point again. So the FBI, well, first of all, um, to kind of reiterate, reiterate what you guys are saying, there's a great book by, uh, I believe his, na his name's Trevor Aronson. He wrote a book like, might have even been up to like almost 10 years ago. Um, I think it was called The Terror Factory. And it was all about the, about the, the FBI uh, entrapment and the, all the, in all these Muslim terror, terrorism cases. Mm -hmm. And just, he went through tons of them and gave all these examples and how the vast majority of them, if I remember correctly, were essentially FBI entrapment cases. There wasn't like a, a genuine um, like terror cell that was planning an attack that the FBI actually caught. Everyone that they actually caught were, were people, were groups of like dimwits often, often, yeah, often dimwits or just these people with no means to actually do anything. Um, like a, maybe a group, a small group of people that get, that get infiltrated and then get, um, um, maneuvered and pushed into these more radical agendas. And you can like, if I were, to, I, I can be, I can even be generous and look at it from the FBI agent's perspective, right? The guys, some of the guys actually doing this where they find that they find people that do show signs of like radicalization, but you know, most of the time these are, um, again, like dim witted, just like, uh, well, you can use some swear words, but just they're, they're not very bright. They're they're not people that you want to hang around. They're not people that um, are very socially accepted or um, or socially adept. And you know, okay, well, this is what we're this is what we have to go for. Okay, so you, so what we, we need to get these guys off the street. How are we going to do it? And we have to keep our budget. How are we going to do it? You can see the like the logic that goes into it. And a lot of this is just to keep budget or to get a budget raise. And the, I think a lot of these guys that were involved in this, in this probably thought they were doing, probably think they're doing the right thing. Um, they justify it. I mean, you can see this in, even if you watch TV shows like police dramas about, you know, they've got the guy, they just don't have the evidence. So the cops, like he plants some evidence because he, 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 you know, he wants to get this guy off the street and he's got these, these, the, these motives, um, that are, from one perspective can be seen as decent motives, but he ends up doing something shady in the, in the pursuit of a goal that he thinks is positive. So, I mean, you can see how this stuff happens just on that level. Of course, there are other levels to it, and that's not the only thing going on there. But just for, just for some background, I recommend that book because uh, I think it was, I think Glenn Greenwald wrote an article fairly recently tying those things together. So he talked about Trevor Aronson's book and some of the things he'd written for I think it was for the Intercept or maybe the Guardian back in you know previous years, and tying that to like the Gretchen Whitmer um, plot and things like that and what's going on. But I mean, that's kind of all details because the point I don't I don't think the point actually fits um, because I don't think there's necessarily a connection between the things um, the things in the first part of this comment and the last bit. So the. I, even even if far re, far right extremism were the the main source of domestic terrorism, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do or have much to do with the direction a country is going in and the potential outcomes of certain social trends. Um, you you can have like let's say that you have X number of 
um, violent incidents in, involving actual like white identitarians every year. Now, let's say that you have a fraction of that that's left wing, but that now this is just a totally hypothetical example, just to show how things aren't necessarily the case. You can have a constant, like a constant for for years, maybe even a, a rising uh, a rising in number of of right wing terror attacks or, or violent incidents over the years, but it might be rising very slow. It might be rising, rising kind of fast. It might be staying the same. It might be going down. You could also have um, left-wing terrorism that's a fraction of that that's rising exponentially and is still less. So it can you can forecast that it could be a bigger problem. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying it could be possible. Or you could have a problem that isn't domestic terrorism. It's not that domestic terrorism is the, is the biggest threat. I mean, the the, the like counter-terrorist forces will want the public to perceive, um, the public and the government, everyone, to perceive that terrorism is the biggest threat, so they get a bigger budget. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the biggest threat to, to humanity or to a country. Um, you could have bigger health threats. You could have bigger political threats. You could have bigger ideological threats. Um, so there's not necessarily a connection. But to, to get... Um, to get to some of the other points, I'll start from the beginning. Or, okay, so what do, want to, what do we want to say about this? So that we don't mention the fact that MAGA and Trumpism are based on white victimhood. You pin victimhood on the left while ignoring it on the right. Well, I don't think that, um, you know, this is a, a common rhetorical sh- strategy is when someone points out an issue is to point out that they didn't point out another issue as if that... Um, like negates negates the the issue that was brought up in the first place, um, because victimhood is you know a, a pathological sense of victimhood is a problem in a lot of people on both sides, right? It's a problem of I would say even people in general. That's one of the things that that um, that is that one of those toxic like emotions and tendencies in people that lead them to kind of lead their lives to fall apart in significant ways. And so in that sense, I can say, okay, yeah, sure. To the, for the people that, that do identify with their victimhood for whatever reason, I think all those people are kind of idiots or at least at the very least engaging in, in something that isn't good for themselves and probably won't be good for the people around them and potentially a wider social circle. So, um, but I don't think that, uh, again, to, well, to take a kind of overview on what's going on, what's going on here, I think that um, I think we've talked about this before. That when it comes to these to these issues, like you, you'll get people people on the on the right who are like, "Oh, it's the lefty commies who are who are the problem." We, you know, there's nothing wrong with us. We don't do anything wrong. And then there's the the lefty commies who are like, "No, the problem is the far right." You know. Uh, neo-fascists and the the white supremacists and the white identitarians, but oh no, we don't do anything wrong. You know, we're all good. Um, when actually most people are crap, in, in in one sense or another, to the extent that they are um, uninformed or ideologically motivated or um, or whatever, the the problem, the reason we've focused, I think, on on so many in so many episodes on um as this guy calls it um um what are some of the terms he uses um, no, left-wing authoritarianism yeah left-wing the uh yeah the far left college S- sjw's mm-hmm. is because of the fact that it is that well in our mind and i think i think objectively it is so um prevalent it's not just it's not just like Antifa or something like uh, there aren't that many Antifa people in the world or in the country. Um, you could, you know, there's a, there's a number of them, but it's not significant. The fact is, is that this kind of, this ideology is in every, has seeped into every facet of, of Western culture mm-hmm. and Western society from, from uh, like in education, from the, from pre-K all the way to university corporations, government, the military, it's, it's everywhere. I don't see, and you know, maybe, uh, prove me wrong. I don't see white identitarianism <laughs> to the same degree. Well, this yeah. is what I was thinking. Like, I don't personally know a white identitarian. I've, I've probably met one, but he's kind of like a closet white identitarian. 
<laughs> but I've never actually met one in person that I, but, and I've met dozens of SJWs. I know a lot of SJWs. Mm -hmm. um, just from my personal experience, I don't, uh, the, the, the numbers just aren't even comparable. No, they're not. And I, I think um, what, what this guy is completely missing is uh, a couple of the main reasons why Trump was voted into power legitimately in 2016. And, uh, you know, to quote, ironically, Bill Clinton, in part, it, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, you had a large number of people who were, uh, who were being disenfranchised by the U.S. economy, which has been financialized and, uh, and, and basically taken over by, um, by large money interests that weren't creating jobs that weren't creating industry that weren't uh providing um for for basic opportunities in in many places particularly in uh the the flyover states of the u.s so uh while a lot of these people may happen to be white uh it it doesn't follow that this is a white issue uh, it follows that it's a it's a social issue. It's a economic issue. It's a it's an issue of being able to uh, to be be economically uh, stable and self reliant by by doing work, which is what these most of these people uh, most of these folks value. The other thing was that a lot of the states that swung in favor of Trump also happened to ha to have had a large number of um, uh, family members who were involved in the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and, and having lost family members or having, uh, experienced the trauma of, of, uh, sick family members who had come back from these useless wars who were, you know, essentially victims of bad political decisions and, you know, wars to instill to create profit and chaos, um, I think there was a deep rec recognition that there was something very wrong with our leadership. So, uh, you know, it, these are these are factors that are largely taken for granted a, among um, a lot of left leaning people in the U.S. Uh, that that don't even um, have a factor in their thinking. It's not even part of the equation. It's it's, it just isn't there. So uh, instead they buy into the idea that this is a white issue. This is about white power. This is about uh, Charlottesville, which was another narrative and, and uh, media created um, sleight of hand to suggest that, uh, you know, white extremists were, you know, or people, just basic conservative people who, who were trying to uphold some semblance of their own values. Uh, you know, all, all of these, all of these folks have been demonized and vilified, uh, as knuckle dragging, backward thinking, uh, racist, xenophobic, you know, uh, extensions of Donald Trump. Um, and that is just a, you know, it, it does those individuals a grave injustice, and it does it does left leaning people a, a grave injustice because their their perceptions are being twisted, and and they're being basically induced to to hate on other people, um, and and that is probably one of the one of the biggest tragedies of what we're seeing right now in the U.S. It's people being pitted against other people without having any kind of real understanding or of, of how our perceptions are being uh, created and, and how our beliefs are being twisted to, uh, to, to influence our, our political decisions and, and what we decide to do and who we decide to follow. Well, one, uh, I mentioned that I don't know any white identitarians. I do know a lot of liberals, like, I've met a lot of liberal Democrats that voted for Trump either in 2016 or 2020. And it's not like these people were closet, closet white supremacists or anything like that. It was for the reasons that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and because of the, 
because of the, um, you know, they might be reluctant to say that publicly or to admit that publicly because they then might be, uh, oh, yeah. you know, thought to be white supremacists or something like that. But it's it's more complicated than than I think a lot of people think of, you know, the, the motivation that went into a lot of people voting for Donald Trump. But that's a... Uh, <clears throat> Just to throw yeah. something else in there for that, that uh, one of the things that sticks out like a sore thumb is just the the demographics of voters for those who supported Trump and MAGA and support conservative uh, thinkers and stuff. The numbers are on the rise for for the black and Hispanic, you know, voting blocks. Like Trump got more black voters than anyone, Mike. You know. In terms of a, a conservative uh, political candidate, he's gotten more than anyone. Uh, same goes for Hispanic voters as well. He got more than anyone else, uh, you know, any conservative in history. It's it's it completely flies in the face of the the idea that this is about white identitarianism and white victimhood, and this is all about uh, supporting white supremacy and the white race. It's like no, this is you know, as you were saying, this is the economy stupid like you know the the disenfranchised of of whatever race of whatever creed all see this same basic thing which is that you know our money is not going where we think it should we aren't we're, we're not getting the same economic opportunities that are possible that we know are possible because of the greed um and because of bad policies and so they wanted to change that and so it's a ready made it's a ready made excuse that that was put out there by the mainstream media that you know the, it was trump's white identitarianism and 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 that's that's just that's not even thinking that's you know that's one of those things that's uh, as y'all said it's put out there for uh rapid consumption for people who um i don't know who who it, it necessarily uh, targets specifically, but like McConkie wrote a, an article just yesterday, um, on multiculturalism as a tool for the Sycorium. And, you know, that's one of the things that he talks about, or one of the things that he says is that it's the Mott and Bailey switch where multi multiculturalism is, you know, they use it as, you know, it's just simply, you know, living together in a multi, multi-ethnic way. Mm -hmm. And really what it is, is about driving division between ethnic groups in order to create problems that then the managerial class can say, see, look, y'all have some problems and you obviously need somebody to fix those problems. And wouldn't you know it, we're here and we can help you. And, and it's, and it's in that way that I can see this same thing being applied here where there's a switch going on where, you know, there's somebody saying like, it's Trump's evil because of white identitarianism when really, and that's the, that's the Mott, but the Bailey is that Trump is evil because he represents populism and an erosion of power of the managerial class. And so it's, it's a bait and switch, uh, as far as I can see. And so, you know, <laughs> what can you what can you do but point that out and be like you know this isn't what you think it is mm -hmm. um i want to say anything about that well one thing um to, to to concede a point there were a lot of i believe um you know garden variety american racists and white identitarians that did vote for trump and uh and that in itself is i think part of the uh, you can fit that into the managerial class like hypothesis. Yeah, that's the way that politics works in the states. Is that any any wing, any any um, like political demographic will have its radical um, fraction, you know, its radical segment, and the left and the right utilizes that to their advantage. Um, the the left does it with with Antifa, and the right does it with the crazies. It's like I mean, Trump Trump did. Um, um, how to put this, like, he, he could have, um, like during his campaign in 2016, he probably could have, um, activated. 
no, um, not activated, but actually more actively dissociated himself from the crazies. Like, you know, there was that one David Duke comment that he made, like, oh, I don't know who he is. You know, I don't know that he's a, I, you know, you know, he, he could have distanced himself more from from the crazies. But the fact is, in politics, when you, in democracy, when you have, a, you know, a system based on popular sovereignty, you want to get as many votes as possible. So you don't you don't want to um, uh, you don't want to diss or, you know, mm-hmm. piss off yeah. too many of your potential supporters, even if they're crazy. And what would it have, what it have, what would it have have served had he done so? Because the people who weren't going to vote for him, which is what he would have been doing to appeal to, uh, by distancing distancing himself more from the crazies, it would have only been to appeal them uh, in terms of like you know oh you're you're a racist and everything. It would have been a, an appeal to them, but they weren't going to vote for him anyway. So it wouldn't have done him any good had he done that. So it. Yeah it kind of comes out in the wash. Yeah. Well, I think that, uh, uh, even, you know, politics is, politics is dirty and, uh, you know, any way you look at it. So well, I think that just has to be taken into, into account too. Yeah. I, I just want to say we're, we're quite prepared to always, um, level some, uh, harsh criticism of right-wing authoritarianism and extremism. That's what I wanted to do now. Yeah. See that, uh, it's just that in the past few years, at least, we haven't seen that element of society burn down cities. We haven't seen that level of influence on the media or in academia or in politics. It just doesn't, it, it just hasn't manifested to the degree, as you were saying earlier, Harrison, as we have with uh, far left um, thinking. And, and so it's front and center. It, it's, what, it's what is staring us and has been staring us in the face for several years now. And it's so deeply entrenched um, that, you know, I, I think to our commenter, it's, it's been normalized. He, it's part of the psychorium in which he swims and, and breathes and, and drinks and, uh, you know, I I know individuals and and friends who sound exactly like him, uh, who are informed by the same talking points. And you know, you asked Adam, uh, you know, you were getting to like, well, you know, how did they come to this um, this place? And the answer, in part, is it's easy. Uh, it's low information that they've consumed and are regurgitating. And, you know, I I know this because I can look back decades ago and and even some years ago and recognize in myself the same, you know, tendency to think and believe I know something for certain and to even react and respond vehemently with arguments uh, and emotion and pseudo facts that lack context and information uh, in argument that was essentially wrong. Um, and it, it, it's, it's work. It's work to, to make these distinctions. It's work to understand something to a level that is closer to objective truth, especially in this. I mean, Jesus, we are, we are so, uh, mind, uh, screwed, um, with information. Um, even to, even to consider alternative sources of information is to, you know, invite the hell upon your head in, in some cases. Um, you know, you're not supposed to be thinking about uh, certain things. It's verboten. Um, and, I, you know, I, I can, anyone who's kind of been uh, reading alternative media on SOT, for instance, for the past few years, is very clear on the fact that uh, you are being told strictly what you should be and and not and should be and, and shouldn't be thinking, uh, and where your sources of information should come from because of this and that fact checker, uh, or this and that comment, or or this and that block, or this and that um, uh, bit of news that that uh, completely twists people's points of view out of proportion. 
So I, I love this bit of the comment though. <clears throat> I got to give props for this. Um, focusing instead on the far left and your strange fantasies of college SJWs turning into Mao. <laughs> Because that that's a, a beautiful um, rhetorical strategy there, um, because of course um, none of us have strange fantasies of SJWs, college SJWs turning into Mao. Um, what we have um, um, objective objective fantasy fantasies about is SJWs turning into the Maoist Red Guard, um, not Mao himself. Um, you know, a thousand or ten thousand or hundreds of thousands of little mouths, that's, uh, that would be quite the fantasy that would actually make a really interesting movie, but, um, <clears throat> no, not Mao, um, the red guard. And you can actually read articles by ex red guard participants, members of the red guard and, uh, Chinese citizens who lived through it, lived through the cultural revolution who are pointing out, uh, ah, this is, you know, I'm getting some some PTSD here, some deja vu, because this is exactly what was going on in China in the 60s. So um, it's not a strange fantasy. Um, SJWs actually do resemble, you know, communist youth from the Cultural Revolution. They're doing similar things. They may, the, I mean, the one thing they're not doing is taking their teacher, teachers out and, you know, killing them on the streets, um, thankfully. But uh, they're doing everything else. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. But on the subject of um, right-wing <clears throat> kind of extremism and white identitarianism. I did want to point out a few things. Um, one, um, the more I learn about those guys, the more I don't like them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, I, I watched a, well, here, a little background. Uh, I think it was in sometime last year. It might've been in like October or something, but uh, PBS Australia did a two-part thing where they had a, they had a guy <clears throat> go undercover in one of these uh, like neo-fascist groups in uh, in in Australia, and so he did. Uh, he went undercover and took like took um, uh, you know hidden camera, secret camera footage of of all these guys, and kind of got a, got an idea of who these guys were, their operations, their plans, and I, I thought it was a, a pretty good um, pretty good expose. But you know, okay, so I'll go the. I'll focus on a couple of different things that were revealed in this, uh, this expose. So one, these guys, you know, a lot of them are, uh, uh, well, there's quite a few douchebags involved. I'll put it that way. So the, the leader of this group is, uh, some douchebag who idolizes Hitler and, you know, has a shrine to Hitler in his, in his house. And, um, on one of their meetings, uh, might've been a Tiki torch meeting. Um, they, he, de he, he decided to, to read some excerpts from Mein Kampf. And so he's on camera saying, you know, oh, I was going to read, I was going to read one excerpt. And then, but then there were just so many good, good passages that I just I decided we should just read the whole thing. So he read from Mein Kampf for like an hour or two, um, like total Looney Tune. But, um, but these guys were, uh, you know, they're work, they work on recruiting. They, they make public videos where they kind of pretend not to be Nazis. And then in private they they just go full Nazi. And, um, and so, I mean, it's a, it's a real, okay. So there's that they, they do like weapons training. Um, they want to, they want like a white revolution and they want to, so they want Australia to, they want to have a, a white revolution so that Australia will be led by the whites and by them and, uh, get rid of all the, you know, all the colored people or whatever. And, and the Jews. Yeah. Yeah. And the Jews. And so, uh, like some of these guys, you see them and they're just sad, right? I mean, they're, um, you know, for anyone who gets hoodwinked by some dumb ideology based on some kind of victimhood or, or whatever, for whatever the motivation, um, you know, it's pretty sad, but these guys, it's a, to, to put it in, per, in perspective, it's a small group of people on the fringe, you know, on the fringe of acceptable society who, who risk losing their entire lives, their reputations, their social standing, whatever they might, whatever social standing they might have. And a lot of these guys are just kind of like, you know, workers, laborers. Mm -hmm. And so when this came out, all of their identities were revealed, right? So these guys are now, now screwed. They, you know, they're, they have zero, you know, revolutionary potential now, now that they've all been publicly outed and doxed. 
And um, that's kind of in, in our society that that seems to me now, you know, I could be wrong in certain pockets, but that seems to me the, to be the trend that there are, that these guys exist, of course. Um, but there aren't very many of them and they are so socially, um, like it's such a socially toxic belief system to be part of that the minute you expose it to anyone who, act, who doesn't actually agree with you, you're, you know, essentially, um, you know, kicked out of the village and have to fend for yourself. It's like, you, you don't really have a, a chance a after that. Any, any neighbors you have will, will refuse to associate with you. You'll probably lose friends and family members. Um, you'll have more trouble getting a job. Um, but come out as an SJW and what happens? It's like, there are, I mean, that, that is the, that is the, the norm these days. Um, you, you have to conform to, to SJW standards. You don't have to conform to white identitarian standards. And if you do, you have to be secret about it because, because if you, if you let on that, that's what you actually believe, you know, you're done. Mm -hmm. And, um, so yeah, there was that, um, it's a, anything else? so it's a, yeah, it's a total, uh, total contra, not, well, it's a total, you know, 180 degree difference between, you know, a, a person who holds radical beliefs on the left versus on the right mm -hmm. at this moment in time, that, that seems to be the case. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the South, been here my whole life. I know just about every kind of, you know, crazy fringe group that's around here. And yeah, there are some white identitarians, mm -hmm. but there's not much. There's there's very few of them. And like you say, they're all kind of dumb. They're not exactly the most sociable people. Um, and that just kind of gets into one of those things where it's like they, they're socially awkward, socially inept, not that bright. And so they kind of use something uh, to, they need something to kind of hold on to and latch onto in order to kind of create a group for themselves. And then it, this just becomes a, a thing for them to, uh, to have a, a social group around, like whether they actually believe or not, it's kind of, I don't know if he, if it's even relevant. Um, but, but yeah, it's not, it's not a super widespread thing. The, the farthest, well, I'll just say like liberalism has gone a long way in terms of its uh, changing of the belief structures of individuals and groups in areas. So like, you know, liberalism within the South has changed the views within the South. Most of the time when you're just talking to people, it's like, you know, a human being is a human being, no matter, you know, who, who they are, what color their skin is or whatever. Uh, they'll have problems with like certain aspects of certain groups of those people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like, uh, like the hardcore gangster rap as an example, it's like, well, that's, that's seen as not a healthy, uh, example for youth. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it, that's what it's seen as, but that's not, a, you know, it's not to besmirch, um, the black community as a whole or, or black people innately, that's just an aspect of, you know, a certain group of people, which is, you know, as I said, it's seen as detrimental to, to that group of people. So it's not like all of these people, you know, all have this, you know, white identitarian thing. And it's just, you know, hiding beneath the surface. It's like, I've lived it. I've been there. I, I joke with the guys here about having uh, a great, great uncle who was in the clan. I have a great, 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 great grandfather who fought for uh, the Alabama militia and the Confederacy, like, and, <laughs> and gosh, darn it. Some of your best friends are black people. <laughs> yeah. And you know, one well, of my, well, one of my best friends in, in college and high school and uh, he was black and then another one was gay. It's like that, that's not really a thing anymore. Like those kind of like strict, um, you know, negative, assumptions about the South, like doesn't really exist anymore. You know, it, what, what you say reminds me a lot of where I work, my day job. I see interracial couples. Mm -hmm. I see, uh, 
people, um, uh, blacks and, and whites getting along just fine, just perfectly beautiful. You would think, you know, that we were in the midst of, uh, of, of, uh, in, in the South. It's the worst form of racism. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's the, uh, the racism that nobody sees. It's, uh, it's there beneath the surface. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the most dangerous kind, which is another thing that, that gets me about all of this stuff is like the, the, the further that liberalism progresses in terms of how it makes society more equal, the more it seems like that, like that ever shrinking minority becomes like overemphasized as being a bigger problem. If that makes the, sense. The, the way I see it is the, the better things get, the, the worse the problems that are getting better become. So <laughs> let's parse that out. So the yes, more racism please. disappears, yeah. the, the last like vestigial elements of racism or the things that can be like massaged and, and transmogrified into forms of racism, which actually, actually aren't forms of racism, mm-hmm. are seen as the worst forms of racism. Oh. So, yeah. so it, it's essentially mountains get made out of molehills as the molehills, you know, s- continue to shrink. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, you have um, like, well, no, we won't get into a discussion of racism all over the planet. But uh, I think objectively, you know, like you're saying that those, those things that you guys are mentioning are evidence of the problem actually getting better, you know, the, the problem of racism actually getting better, but it gets as you're saying, Adam, it gets emphasized even more as things get better, which is kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing, don't you think? It's weaponized. Yeah. It's totally yeah. weaponized. And that's what the managerial class does. They, that's what pathocrats do. They weaponize past problems or, or problems that are, uh, that should be put into perspective and, and they magnify it, uh, and, and stress it and, uh, put a emotional weight on it that is out of all proportion that uh, in the minds of many permits for, for a reaction that is unhealthy, destructive and, um, and results in, uh, in individuals writing to mind matters with uh, uninformed uh, points of view and, um, we appreciate it, by the way. It's an, an opportunity, an exercise to to think about and discuss what we what we think we know for a fact. Um, but uh, it doesn't change um, the fact that you're mostly wrong. I, I appreciate the image of a whole horde of SJWs morphing into little mouths. You know, <laughs> so we have a. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe they just like, you know, a, a thousand little people, do, they, they start like, you know, uh, morphing together and then they, yes. and then they become one, like one giant Mao instead of like the giant Stay Puft Marshmallow Man from Ghostbusters. It's just one giant Mao stomping through New York City. <laughs> yes. OK, well, I think we're we're going to end it there. I'll just give a tiny preview of this book, which we'll be discussing. Um. Who knows, depending on how long it takes to read, we might be discussing this book at point at, at <laughs> forever. Yeah, forever. <laughs> um, but this book, I'll just read <clears throat> the beginning of the, the endorsement, the blurb by Professor, Professor Charles Foster from Oxford on the back cover. It's very simple. This is one of the most important books ever published. And yes, I do mean ever. So that's some pretty high praise. And for those of you who don't know Ian McGilchrist, he uh, he wrote one other book called The Master and His Emissary about uh, brain hemispheres, so uh, brain lateralization, and the the kind of the the truth about and dispelling the myths about um, brain lateralization, so the difference between the right and left hemispheres. So that's what that book is about. This book takes that, goes with it, um, expands on it and applies it in very interesting ways. The first part of the book, which is the one I'm reading, is on the paths or the paths to truth or the means, the means to truth, the portals, the means or portals to truth. So these are the, the, the parts of human psychology, you know, our basic, uh, our basic human nature 
that allow for um, for coming to know the world. And the, the ways in which the hemispheres differ in the way we approach the world, we see the world, we make sense of the world. And the other parts of the book, it will, the, the second part will get into the, the paths to truth, so the ways in which we know the world. Um, and then the third part is applying it to all kinds of things like philosophy and theology. And, and I think his main point will be that, the, that the, the dominance of one hemisphere or the other in an individual or in a kind of averaged out over a group of people will determine the kind of philosophy that they, they take to life and to, to the universe. And so that um, kind of reductive materialism is very much a left brain way of looking at the world, um, as opposed to a right wing, right wing, <laughs> a right hemisphere view, which um, is kind of more encompassing, sees the holes, sees the connections between things and um, sees more in general than the left hemisphere. So he's going to be looking at kind of like the entire history of of philosophy and the debates in philosophy in the in the you know in the second volume, and how that might be informed by an understanding of the way the hemispheres work, and just a little bit on the first section on these uh, the portals, he talks about attention, perception, uh, judgment, apprehension, um, like literally apprehension, um, grasping at things, and how first how these relate to the hemispheres, but the way he goes about that is through uh, like an extensive look at the literature on um, on these hemispheres and the, and the way that a lot of things are known about the hemispheres is through brain damage. So you'll have a stroke or brain damage on one side of the brain or the other, and then you look at the types of pathologies that develop um, in response to these um, like assaults to the brain. And you can learn a lot about what's going on by the the, the faculties that, that get screwed up f- from uh, a certain type of, of brain lesion. And one of the things we'll be discussing probably in, the, in, our, in our first discussion on this is some of those pathologies, some of those effects, because, I mean, we've all heard, I think we've all heard some of the very strange things about some of the very strange pathologies and delusions that people can have, but uh, to have them all laid out here is um, um, kind of overwhelming, but it's very informative. Um, just the the ways and the degrees in which our perception can be totally skewed. Maybe I'll just give one example. So one example of like a um, of a right hemisphere damage is can be not you know not always depends on where it is and just the individual in question, but a complete lack of awareness of the left side of your body. So or is that right? Um, well, it's one side of the body. Right brain, pretty, left side of the body. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure that's pretty sure that's what it was. So to the point where. The, the person afflicted with with this will cannot perceive the left side of their body at all, will not acknowledge its existence. As far as they're concerned, they only have the right half of their body. They can't see it. They can't feel it. They can't like verbally acknowledge it or consciously, um, or they're not consciously aware of it. And to the point where if they're lying in bed and they do have some kind of um, perception of their left arm, the, the, their left hemisphere will come to the conclusion that it must be that it, not only it must be it is someone else's arm. Oh, well, that's my that's my grandma's arm. It's like oh, well, your grandma's dead. It's like oh, it must be a dead arm. <laughs> um, and and nothing can get through to the left hemisphere. Once it's made up its mind about something, nothing can change its mind. It is absolutely certain that that's the case. And uh, one more short short example. One of these other um, delusions is the belief that your body is actually dead. So some people with these right hemisphere lesions, um, there's a word for it, uh, you know, some Greek derived word, but um, the, that they will believe that their body is dead, that they are actually a corpse. And he gives one example, I believe it was McIlgris himself, it might have been um, someone else that he was quoting, but I think it was him, who um, took some blood from one of these patients. And it's like, okay, well, let's, let's do a test. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to draw some blood from you. And she says, Oh, you know, good luck. You're not going to get any because I don't have any blood left. I'm a, I'm a corpse. I don't have blood anymore. So he draws the blood and shows it and says, "Oh, look, you know, you've got some. You got you got some blood." And she just says, "You put it there," and just complete denial about the the fact that that was her blood. Immediately, again, the left hemisphere comes up with the conclusion that, well, because I'm a corpse, because I have no blood, the only possible explanation is that it, he must have put it there, and so she states with absolute certainty that he put it there. 
And that's one of those features of the left hemisphere is the absolute certainty, that need for certainty. No matter how batshit crazy what it's saying is, it comes up with a narrative and that's the one it sticks to. Well, it might, it might change. Who knows? You know, it might come up with a, a different scenario, a different narrative. But, but in that moment, that's the one that it believes and that it puts forward with complete certitude, complete confidence. And that's just one aspect of the, the left hemisphere way of dealing with the world. And why he argues is that, well, naturally, um, you need both hemispheres. You know, one without the other isn't going to do the job um, as well. But the right hemisphere tends to do the job better than the left. Um, so very, very short overview of just like, you know, one page worth of material in that <laughs> 190 pages. But we'll be getting back to that. So thanks for tuning in and uh, tune in because we will have a lot of interesting things to say this year. So make sure to subscribe if you like us and try to get those notifications. And yeah, we always appreciate comments. Uh, warning, we may read them on the air and you may not agree with our take on your comment, but uh, we appreciate them nonetheless. So thanks everyone and take care. 